This is PodKit, episode 32, From Zero to Accelerating, on September 18th, 2017. And now, our sponsor this week is Entropy. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad, with show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk32. Hello. Hi. Hi. So this is a a little deja vu right here. A little bit. Truly, truly. Now the question is, is this deja vu from the future, the past, or the present? Well, regardless, it's perfect for deja vu to be on Pocket 32, Electric Boot. Ooh. Wow, that is... Ooh, that's perfect. Almost like we scripted that before the show. I can't believe it. Can you? I can. (laughs) Oh, man. So, uh, now that we have started again, so I my, my Hackintosh crashed, and in the, the, the pre, pre-print, wow, pre-fringe, Brandon was having issues with his internet, so... Yes, there are no drivers for Windows. Uh, that is or that Linux, well established. or OS ten, as it turns out. <laughs> nope. <laughs> yes, when running on non-Apple hardware. So this, this episode of PodKit has... has Put, we've, we've put a lot of work into this, so it's going to be a great one. <laughs> Truly. Our, our sponsor this week <laughs> is uh, Entropy. <laughs> Entropy. It's slowly tearing you and I and everyone else apart. It's unavoidable. Entropy. Well, right, I think we that. should uh, begin... <laughs> And we should talk about what happened last week, which is extremely important, which is the Apple event that um, showed off the new iPhone 8. Yeah. So just before we put our our quick thoughts in, me and Ryan did cover this in the Nexus special, which you can find at thenexus.tv slash ns55. So this is where Apple released the Apple Watch Series 3, the iPhone 8, iPhone 8 Plus, iPhone 10, and the the great and the wonderful Apple TV 4K. <laughs> I, I like how um, in our Deja Vu version, we did not talk about the Apple TV at all. Um, but now now let's start with the Apple TV. Okay, let's start with the Apple TV. It has so 4K is... and a circle around its home menu button. Yes, a, w- a white circle on the, on the remote. That's that a is lot. How, that is how you upgrade a product from version to version release a 1.1 version of its remote (laughs) but uh, the apple tv got 4k hdr uh a couple different hdr specs i think there's a dolby one and then another standard um i personally won't be buying one of these i don't own a 4k display so that will be a purchase i will have later and their cpu is much faster um did i think they demoed a game on there that will launch on the apple tv from that no one will play what was it? Was it from that game company? Yeah, I that think? game company. They're legendary for doing those kind of uh, experimental games where you have very limited interaction with other players, but also it's massively online. Uh, if I recall correctly, that's kind of their claim to fame. Uh, yeah, they made really uh, Journey. Journey. Was that the one with the the flower petal flying through the air? Uh, that was so. that was Flow. Flow. Okay. Oh. I think that was their game, though, right? Yeah. So okay. the new game is called Sky, which is really clever. Okay, yeah, I I'd like to check it out sometime. So that's the Apple TV. Um, there's also the iPhone 8, which is pretty similar to the iPhone 7, uh, but it has a glass back, wireless charging, the new A11 Bionic uh, chip. Uh, what else does it have? A True Tone display. Uh, Fifty dollars more expensive, but comes at sixty-four gigabytes. And then there's the iPhone 10, of course, which has the long rumored and leaked rumored uh, uh, full screen display and the Face ID camera system. Uh, yeah, an interesting bit, if, uh, yeah. if you don't mind the pause there, about that Face ID uh, system. Uh, that, that's kind of the uh, what's been commonly referred to as the notch at the top of the screen. Uh, and the interesting thing about it is that it's actually designed by the company that uh built the original connect um yeah which apple, really? which apple purchased yeah uh, a couple, oh, I didn't couple know years ago five five six years ago uh so to see that miniaturized 
drastically miniaturized. Yeah, that's crazy miniaturization. It's pretty wow. unreal. Now, of course, there's some there's some pretty uh, substantial differences from it, which I am not uh, not fully acquainted with. Um, simply simply that they've done something that is so precise in depth mapping that that it can be used for identification. Um, that's uh, and it's miniaturized to such a degree. That's pretty awesome. So it's definitely going to be cool to see what that hardware. Uh, what the hardware can do and what will be made available to developers. Yeah, and it's supposed to be much more reliable or accurate or less f- or have fewer false positives than Touch ID. I think they said the failure rate was 1 in 50,000 for Touch ID and it's so 1 in a million for you, Face ID. You give up failure rate for accidental activation rate. Mm. So I think what we'll see when the, the iPhone 10 comes out and it's just sitting on your desk is... As people walk by your your desk at work, it'll be looking at everybody's face, hoping that it's you, its long lost friend, and it won't be. And then eventually, it'll just lock itself out. <laughs> that has to be the saddest, the saddest <laughs> description of such a thing that I've ever heard. But it's kind of awesome. <laughs> that is kind of yeah. awesome. I hope it doesn't search for faces when it's not being touched. Like you have to like raise it or tap the screen for it to start looking. I I, hope, I, I I would uh I would I would assume they have some tech because I think I've heard it described as raised to wake, but yeah. that isn't convincing necessarily to me. Yeah, that's a little bit uh it's a little bit rough on the i uh, on the Apple Watch even the raised to wake functionality I found at least um but I you know definitely I, I bet that they have some uh, other tech in a phone that can assist that a little bit more than my Series 0 Apple Watch. Well, and what's better about the phone is typically if the phone's on a desk and then you pick it up, it'll mm. you're, you're doing a totally different, like, from 0 to acceleration, whereas the watch is almost always accelerating because you're always moving. That is yeah. absolutely true. And then finally, there's the Apple Watch Series 3 with cellular. Uh, I personally did pre-order one of these, uh, last Friday at 2 a.m. And this adds uh, LTE radio and what was it? 0.25 millimeters more thickness to the uh, whatever the the heart rate monitor part on the bottom of the watch. Mm. So uh, two th- sheets of paper thicker, but we get LTE. Uh, it's also 1.7 times faster than the Apple Watch Series 2, which is also loads faster and has a second core when compared to the initial apple watch which brandon and i both have so i'm very excited to get this much faster watch that has gps which i'm not used to better waterproofing which i'm not used to and cellular which no one is used to yet yeah absolutely i'm definitely going to be hopping on this train probably in the next couple months uh today is not that day nor was uh nor was uh, late last week but uh at some point uh, I'll definitely be uh, hopping on that bandwagon, if if only because um, the Series Zero watch uh, doesn't have GPS built in, and I've been feeling the pain of not having GPS uh, in my watch for some time. And yeah, to have, absolutely. And to have the first uh, watch I have that has GPS also have cellular in it is probably going to be something pretty uh, pretty enticing for sure, for sure. Yeah, and I would love to talk about it on Second Opinion. Yes, <laughs> soon, so soon. Uh, next up, I think uh, we've got some other kind of timely news, if that's uh, if that's cool. Uh, yeah. The first of which being uh, recently came out that CCleaner, an app that's commonly used to uh, conduct some common malware removal and uh, uh, scheduled cleaning tasks for uh, for Windows machines in particular, uh, has been um, exploited in some regard uh, and basically now a bunch of folks have this uh compromised installer and compromised executable running on their machine uh often uh already scheduled so this is kind of gross for a number of reasons because ccleaner used to be a thing that uh, i would recommend to people i know that were having trouble with windows computers because it it had such a reputation right it had a reputation for being a reliable uh tool for removing these kind of malicious software programs um, malicious software programs. Who am I? Gosh, that's like not the phrase, <laughs> but uh, you, you get what I'm saying. Um, but uh, I think it. This is just one in a series of situations where we found uh, companies like that running into some uh, some financial difficulty. Um, I know the the company that first developed CCleaner uh, was purchased by Avast over time, and Avast is also 
uh, kind of seen some criticism for basically kind of devolving into an adware company over time. Um, I think so. I, I think kind of like all antivirus companies are sort of like that. Yeah. Like the ads they spew are ads for themselves. Right. Which makes it a little bit better, but not much. Right. Um, and I think CCleaner has been kind of going down this road for many years. So as soon as they added the uh, smart cookie awareness tracking thing, so like, yeah. it'll only delete some cookies somehow through some mm-hmm. whitelist that people probably can pay for to get on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when they added the scheduled service, um, it was sort of a sign that this probably won't last. Mm-hmm. It's a, um, well, it, it was closed source too, right? So it's just exactly. a black box that everyone is installing with some pretty high level security permissions or system permissions. So yeah, not yeah. good. So I think, I think what will end, end, end up happening because of this is there will be, um, so there are some alternatives on Linux, for example, called uh, Bleachbit, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and Bleachbit does the same exact stuff. It has a list of directories that can go, goes to look for and deletes them if they're there. Um, and I would imagine that there will be an open source version of CCleaner like functionality in the future. Yeah. Yeah, right I definitely on. could see that coming. Right on. It's a, yeah. It's, it's a great hole for open source to fill. Absolutely. Uh, well, next up, uh, we discussed uh, talking about this uh, new uh, DRM or digital restriction management uh, spec that's under consideration at the W3C recently. Uh, sounds like there's quite a bit of controversy surrounding it. Admittedly, I'm not the most well versed in it, um, but yeah, what's what's going on? What do you guys think about it? Yeah, so uh, it's interesting. So it's weird that the EFF doesn't take the pragmatic approach in this, and that is, well, they didn't get what they wanted this time, but they probably should stay there so that they can at least tempt the w3c to do what they want next time yeah um right. and and so i think brian added this uh story from uh john gruber um uh, during fireball which is um he takes the view of he hates derm drm but he's a fan of practicality and that well you know it sucks to have it in all the browsers but i would prefer to have a browser that can play you know, a video like from Netflix than one that doesn't. Yeah. And I think, I think it's better to have DRM implemented in the browser versus a plugin. So I think this is a better alternative to not being able to do a lot of this kind of stuff. Right. Silver light or flash or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, no one supporting the web and doing only native applications. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a tricky situation, but I think, I don't know, we'll have to see. It's kind of bittersweet, I guess. On, on, on one hand, like, I understand where John is coming from. I don't know if I would say that, like, like DRM in the browser shouldn't be a too big of a sticking point because we're already on, on death's door for all of web tech because as soon as web art, uh, not web RTC, as soon as uh, web assembly takes over, you won't be able to right click on something and see its source code anymore. Even if it is completely, you know, packed up in single character nonsense, um, mm-hmm. it'll all be running in a secret binary and nobody will know what it does or how it works. So, you know, on one hand, this is it's bad from the you know purity standpoint, but on the other hand, it's kind of a moot point at this point. Yep, I think that all sums it up quite well. Truly. So, do you remember LeftPad? Sure do. I use it every day. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I you know I think a lot of people use LeftPad every day. Um, how el- yes. how else would I get uh, spaces on the left side of a string? Um, on none other than importing a six fo- six line file through a package manager. Use, Always. use right pad and some substring magic. <laughs> <laughs> right pad in reverse. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, um, so funny story. So last night I was um, doing some work uh, late at night, and my last commit and, and push was about eleven o two, 
and I look, check the build system, and I got my hip chat message and build successful, and um, I went to sleep. So then this morning I uh, went to work and I wanted to push one more tweak before I wanted to show it to my team um, for stand up, and uh, well, I I got a build failure, and I was Uh-oh. baffled because. I didn't actually do anything. I just changed the capitalization of some text. Well, it turns out um, we have a Jenkins-like build process where it clones the repo and installs NPM packages and then builds. Well, we had a mini mini left pad event today. Um, So here's what happened. So as you know, I'm kind of the view guy around here. Hmm. And Vue uses a particular plugin or a particular package that uh, they made called Vue Loader. And Vue Loader um, allows Vue projects to have the uh, single component files. So you put your HTML and your CSS and your script all in one file, neatly packed together. Well, they had been using a package called JS Beautify. And JS Beautify was used for various reasons to. Uh, pretty print the um, render function. That's not important. What is important is JS Beautify last night pushed up version 1.7.0. Well, apparently whoever pushed it up didn't do it quite right. They were trying to do some optimizations with what was packaged up and then pushed to NPM's repo. And they didn't stay awake after to make sure it all worked. They went to sleep and, well, basically for nine hours, pretty much every Vue CLI project didn't work, and many other projects didn't work that relied on JS Beautify. Um, so, so this is a really interesting thing. So, what happens in this web kind of, um, I don't know, paradigm is, you know, everybody relies on these packages, and that um, those packages rely on other packages. And those packages rely on even more other packages. And you don't really know, like, you wrote maybe a few thousand lines of your application, but there's 500,000 lines of code that you never saw. And you don't have a clue how it works. And it's just out there. So, you know, this, uh, it was an easy fix. Um, you know, six hours after it happened, um, JS Beautify did, in fact, upgrade their package to not break anymore, uh, which was nice, and they kind of put together a, a lessons learned document in their changelog, which was nice of them. Um, and for the Vue community, um, Evan Yu, the creator of Vue, actually acted very quick. Within uh, about three hours of when this first started happening, he made an emergency build um, a view loader that um, would allow um, the code to be formatted by Prettier instead of JS Beautify. So, you know, it worked out, but man, is this is this environment pretty fragile? Absolutely. Yeah. That's, uh, That's a pretty yeah. bonkers too that it's something so like trivial to. Well, what I, I guess I don't I don't know totally the view function, but if or the, like so, how, how view works, but like I think that it so feels if you like... take a look at the commit, you can see exactly where um, JS Beautifier was being used in this commit, and then yeah. promptly removed. Um, so basically, the HTML template is transpiled into um, like JavaScript, sort yeah. of like JSX, but without the X part. For sure. Um, yep. And I'm, I'm and familiar. so they were. <laughs> And they were using JS Beautify to kind of pretty print that code um, for debugging reasons in development. Uh-huh. Well, it it's gone. So now what? Now how do we do it? What do we do? Yep. Prettier was prettier was the answer. Truly. Well, and uh, as as somebody who uses prettier day to day, prettier is always the answer. But yeah. uh, I, I get I get what you're saying though. Um, I I can see why that'd be helpful. Um, and I could I could see absolutely see why relying on that felt kind of like a no brainer, um, but I I guess when I originally thought about this is like for me prettier is not a production dependency right it's right. a 
It's a dev dependency. It's yep. something that I use to work in my own environment, and if there was something wrong with it, I would note it, um, and it wouldn't break my build. I think I think my, the lesson that I learned was, so we're not in deployment phase yet of this yeah. application. It's still in development. So even though we have a Jenkins build, it's not being told to build for like, build this for develop or build this for production. Mm. Strip all of the console logs and do all that stuff. It's still being told do a build, but build for development because that's what we're doing right now. For sure, for sure. And I guess I guess the lesson that I learned is once you've once you've gotten to a certain point, you should probably pin your dependencies somewhere, whether that be through yarn lock or through um, package lock JSON, um, package lock or shrink wrap. I guess if you're crazy. Um, so you know any of those choices, because um, that would have prevented this. Mm-hmm. I think um, I saw. I'm trying to find the comment, but there is a um, comment in one of the threads on GitHub that someone posted to um, the pull request hack. Yep. Found it, um, and I'll link this in the show notes. It was um, a little article, pretty short, about. Uh, if someone submits a pull request, add them as a maintainer or with with right access to the repository. So they are inclined to do more work on a repository because they feel like they have now they have the, the, the power to do it. And so, you know, they'll be more invested in it rather than just kind of committing into the void and hoping someone accepts a pull request. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the one of the issues there was there was only one or two people who had push access to that repository. Right. Yep. And for something this popular, that seemed like a big problem. Um, and at the same time, um, I think, yeah, you know, more checks, more people involved are, are going to help something like that. Um, I saw there's an issue on JS beautify for calling out for more contributors and create a beta channel, beta channel for releases and review version numbering policies um, and install tests for packages. Yep. All, all of these kind of things is fallout from that. Um, I think as a whole web community, I think default npm does the caret, so any major version. And so that's generally okay, but in many cases, packages still have some minor but still breaking changes on the minor versions. Uh huh. And so I think in many cases it makes sense to do the the tilde, but that depends on which dependency you're using so it's kind of hard to automate and so what's even worse is that you might be responsible for the dependencies that you specifically include but there's no reason to believe that those dependencies are responsible yeah yeah exactly so it's just a chain of of unstable ground yep um i think what else was i gonna say um yeah, I, I wonder if view loader going to pretty pretty fire. What is pretty, it? Prettier. 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 Yes, thank you. Uh I wonder if that's going to kind of start more people going to prettier and coming from JS Beautify. So, I, it, it doesn't really matter that view totally. just happens to use prettier. Like you don't actually ever see this code in person unless you happen to be putting a breakpoint in a component that's rendered. But my point is, even even within the nine hours while this was down, since view loader switched, that's a pretty large um, library that they switched. So many people probably didn't notice that it was down if they weren't working at the time. But right. for those who were paying attention, maybe saw this change, and so they switched to Prettier as well. It's so possible. Prettier um, maybe just had a boost of traffic today, but I think, yeah, ultimately I hope JS Beautify comes out on top and has more active involvement and some better policies and everyone can learn from this, but we'll see. So it's funny that we're talking about prettier because, um, you know, Brandon would know about this, but, but is it true that prettier is made by Facebook? Uh, prettier is made by people with affiliations to Facebook IRC. Uh, I don't believe it is owned directly by Facebook. Well, that's good because if it was, it'd be really funny if the, uh, Facebook patent license got in, to view through prettier because of this that would be hilarious but no uh <laughs> so by by the way uh prettier is maintained in part by james long yep. uh, who does have commit access to a lot of react stuff in the react community organization yeah that must be why believe, i was confused i do not believe that he is employed by uh bookface he is not that's, he that's runs, true 
and even better, the prettier license is MIT, like yep. all licenses should be. Truly, so truly. let's continue on with this horribly amazing patent battle. Yes, so at this point, uh, if, if you've followed uh, anything uh, related to the React ecosystem, you've probably heard about the kind of kerfuffle of sorts around uh, the license that ships with uh, React and its uh, sibling and, and child products uh, that is often referred to as like a modified BSD license. Uh, so what this generally means is that um, there's a, a possibility that under certain conditions, if you sue Facebook, Facebook can revoke your license to use React. Uh, is dun that, dun dun. Is that yeah right? Is that is that is that a solid summary for that? Perhaps a little bit uh, uh, a little bit alarmist, but more or less on the nose. Uh, from what I understand, that is correct. Uh, yeah. Now, of course, the, the the thing to note here is that the situations where uh, the, the situations where you might be exposed to something like this are the situations where you plan to sue Facebook. Uh, and it's probably even narrower than that, but I'm not a lawyer, so I, let, let's take the pessimistic view and say, if I were to sue Facebook uh, for something totally unrelated, maybe in that case they could revoke my license to React. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. Um, but I'm not very likely to sue Facebook, certainly not as an individual, uh, nor is Facebook likely to do something that will provoke me to sue, um, because I'm not a very litigious individual. Um, but I could definitely see how certain entities of certain uh, of, of that are operating at a certain scale uh, could be absolutely concerned by this and perhaps ought to be. Um, and uh, as a result, over the past couple of months, there's been quite a lot of thought on this. And generally, things have died down a little bit. Uh, what with prominent figures like uh, Dan Abramov and others in the React community kind of speaking uh, to this issue and um, towards some of the rationale for for why that license is included and why some folks think it's reasonable uh that are kind of the conversation around this had kind of mellowed out over time uh until yesterday and that's because uh yesterday uh yesterday was it yesterday i'm not 100 yeah, sure recently yesterday recently, ish yeah. yes yesterday if you don't count the weekends uh the uh company behind wordpress.com uh, and the WordPress project called Automatic, uh, they uh, recently announced that they are essentially uh, slowly but surely going to cut ties with, uh, with React in the sense of um, rewriting uh, a project that they recently re-implemented entirely in React in something that is not React now. Uh, and it seems like uh, all... All indications are that uh, WordPress as a whole and all of the uh, all of the kind of constituent projects that support uh, WordPress are kind of looking to avoid uh, using React as part uh, it directly related to this patent issue, uh, and that's kind of that's kind of a lot. <laughs> that's kind of a, so, a pretty solid blow. So what I'll do is I'll read the the this uh, little quote here from Matt's website. Matt Mullenweg is the creator and founder of WordPress mm -hmm. and Automatic, of course. So core WordPress updates go out to over a quarter of all websites. Having them all inherit the patents clause isn't something I'm comfortable with. I think Facebook's clause is actually clearer than many other approaches companies could take, and Facebook has been one of the better open source contributors out there. But we have a lot of problems to tackle, and convincing the world that the Facebook patents clause is fine isn't ours to take on it's their fight so i think that's one of some of the best um shorthand reasoning for why wordpress is doing this they control half of all websites um and it's unlikely that facebook is going to sue the um bottom 99.999 percent of those websites but what happens when um, you know some some engineer at Google is uh, just hanging out and he makes a, a, a blog with um, WordPress in it and it happens to have React code in it and for whatever reason that week there's a lawsuit with Facebook. I mean, who knows? Um, although that even seems unlikely. Um, but I get where, the, where where he's coming from here. Absolutely, absolutely, and and you're right. I think not only is that 
some of the best kind of uh, the, the the shortest but like most uh, effective distillation of why a company might uh, take a step back uh, from something like this. Uh, it's also some of the best just like uh, maintainer software maintainer communication I've ever read. Simultaneously, this yes. is a really great post, and I'd encourage you if you haven't read it already to uh, go give it a read. Um, so I, I also put the link in here to um, the the Gutenberg uh, issue on on the WordPress GitHub, where um, basically it's it's a call for choosing the next JavaScript framework for Gutenberg. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, some of the options, Vue.js, Preact, uh, Angular, Ember, Polymer, Marco, Inferno, and, and or Aurelia. Um, so I guess my follow-up question is, how do we feel about React being replaced by Vue um, in sort of the largest um, single web framework thing out there? It would extremely legitimized vue.js i think so i so mean if it hasn't been proved already that's but. that's one that's one one view ha huh, get it <laughs> nah. uh um, i would i would definitely i'd definitely be kind of on the same page with that i know a lot of people who are really into view and i know you're one of them ryan um and i i haven't worked on a project with it yet but it seems uh it seems really mature and solid uh as, as certainly as much as any of the uh uh, any of the kind of new hip web frameworks can be. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, um, and you're going to hear this here first. Um, I'm slowly melting away from view a little bit. Like, oh, getting really? there. Interesting. Um, and, and, and so like there's things about react that I've always loved and that I just can't have in view. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll talk about that a different day. And so for the next, uh, five weeks or so, you can think about why, I'm slowly becoming less of a viewist and more of a not viewist. But I cannot it, wait for Podcat thirty three. Absolutely. But suffice it to say, I'm still completely a viewist. I'm just becoming less of an enthusiast. I'm still a user. Gotcha. Um, so I think I think um, my view on this is is for many years, WordPress has brought the PHP community uh, basically infinite grief from everybody else who who has um, ever coded anything um which is sort of unfortunate and so if view is to become the uh wordpress of javascript like no uh, so P- wordpress is to php as view is to javascript so like if that happens what's bad about that is Everybody will say, oh, Vue is terrible because WordPress uses it. Mm. And I don't really want that to happen. Um, My other problem sort of with this, and this is sort of an implementation level detail. And, of course, everybody knows a podcast is no time to be solutioning. But WordPress is sort of a static thing. So, like, it's not like a single page application. You kind of just put put javascript in and it just runs whenever the page loads Mm -hmm. um vue.js really shines when it's um pre-compiled in the Vue cli templating system um you can use it without that but it's not nearly as powerful and as usable without it and so wordpress would be using it for its alternative use case i think so pull it back a little bit i think so and uh, i think um like I don't know how that that stacks up differently against React, for example, because I, as far as I know, nobody in their right mind uses React um, with the runtime version of the JXX transformer anymore. I'm pretty sure that doesn't even exist now. For sure. So maybe it's the same. Maybe that was always part of the plan, and they're going to figure out a way to pre-compile stuff and then put it into an npm package or something. But I I don't know. Um, on the other hand, maybe this maybe this makes Vue like like you guys kind of suggested, way more popular and way more legitimized. And if that's the case, that's cool too. But we just have to be very careful. Mm-hmm. Yep. Definitely. I wonder if. So I've never used React. I've hardly even looked at it. I, it's like Vue, by the way. To a corner. <laughs> <laughs> Vue seems more similar to Angular than it does to... Now, that's probably because I've only used JS, but Vue seems quite similar to Angular in many ways. As yeah. a React user, I would also probably say it reminds me most of Angular, 
but that's probably because I'm mostly coming from a React uh, perspective. Well, yeah. so it's it's funny. Um, again, this this is for another podcast, but um, part of my reason for being less of a viewist these days is because a lot of what I want to do involves what I could just achieve if I were using React. Mm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Interesting. Very uh, I interesting. If, <laughs> I wonder if I can just skip over using React. Like and ever. go straight to view. Um, yeah, I'm so thinking it's probably more likely. I don't know. It, it we'll is see. very likely, and the uh, certainly the uh, job market will accept you with uh, very reactive, welcoming arms. Um, <laughs> but I would say that it is quite insightful to see what Vue does um, with its particular flavor of componentization, but also mm. with templating. Um, so just yeah. do 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 all of them equally, I guess. For sure, for sure. Yeah. One other thing I'll add is that Glimmer remains cool. It's only <laughs> gotten it's only gotten cooler since last time I checked, um, and I haven't done anything super massive with it yet. But I vaguely updated my website Brandon.mn with uh, Glimmer components, uh, and it makes me really excited for the future of Glimmer as well as Ember. And uh, I'm starting to kind of be more open to component runtimes that aren't React as a result, which is which is cool. So. If if even if even if none of those things ever pan out, uh, it's definitely kind of uh, giving me more transferable uh, kind of models of web components, which is kind of cool. I and I think um, so. Sean Larkin, the the WebKit guy, WebKit no Webpack guy. Oh no! Um, what's the difference? They're both web things. Truly. So the I've web messed guy. up. I've messed up web web RTC web uh, assembly. WebKit, WebPack. What else can and I mess up with the word web in front of it? I think in our failed ep- recording, you said WebKit instead of WebOS. <laughs> All good. Uh, <laughs> nobody will know. So um, he's actually done some work with um, transpiling view components, view single file components, and React components, uh, multi-file, of course, into effectively a uh, little little HTML web, actual web components. Nice. Um, so that's actually really super cool because that means there's a much higher level of interop between those things, even though they're completely different internally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd agree completely. And I think that's what's going to be, that's probably going to be what uh, makes it so that these frameworks are a little bit more transient than they currently seem, which is good. Yeah, definitely. All right. So, another, yeah. Did you hear about that Microsoft? Yeah, it's a company, right? Again, finally. Woo! It wasn't for a while, but now it is. And I learned this because there was an article about them in a magazine you might have heard of called Fast Company, and they only talk about I, companies in Fast Company. I guarantee that not a single listener of this episode of Podkit has ever seen physically the magazine Fast Company. Of course not. Wait, I sure haven't. Does it not have a magazine? Is it not a magazine? Am I losing it? Oh, it is. It, no, it, it, it is physically is a, magazine, a magazine. But nobody has ever seen Fast Company as a magazine. But no, I swear I have. Yeah. No. Well, but you're not a listener, so it doesn't count. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> it's that. It's that darn J school life messing with me. Journalism. It is. Um, What's that uh, about? Uh, t- t- Trust me, I I understand where you're coming from. I get it. I, yeah, I'm so, pretty sure. So mm, this uh, this this article was was indeed printed in uh, the October issue of Fast Company, but um, it sort of summarizes the uh, chronicles of Satya Nadella and um, his kind of journey through Microsoft to to now. Some yeah, something I've 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 seen just from Twitter and hearing and seeing what Microsoft has been doing last few years, it seems like the biggest change is a shift in, in company culture, which has in turn, um, I think opened up the company a lot more. And that's kind of related, you know, internal po- political culture as well as I, I guess kind of, I guess that that's the same thing. <laughs> so they, they've released and been open about more things. And with that, a change in company culture. And I think that's all for the best. Um, this article talks about their, the market cap has increased by two hundred and fifty billion dollars, and so they're they're doing quite well. 
um, despite all these changes. And I think that's for the best. We, um, us as a community, have gotten a lot of things out of it. Um, some of the the big changes that they've they've done is releasing Office for iPad, which was, I think, done in the same day that Nadella was made CEO. Mm-hmm. Um, they bought, or I guess they under Steve Ballmer, they bought Nokia, but they kind of canceled that, got rid of Windows Phone. They bought LinkedIn for twenty six billion dollars. They joined the Linux consortium. They've really been pushing Azure, uh, Microsoft SQL Server. Yeah. Push, um, GitHub usage. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server is really neat because it's available for Linux. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. .NET Core. Woo! You bet. And they've got uh, Linux subsystem on Windows. They've been releasing uh, Visual Studio Code on Mac and Linux. And yeah. Windows. And, and Windows. Uh, yeah. And Visual oh, Studio. Wait, full... wait, wait about that crazy thing. Um, what is it called? The the Linux subsystem for Windows? Yeah, uh, no, like, it's the it's the Windows subsystem for Linux because Windows always has to come first in Microsoft product names. Even though technically it's not a it's not a Windows subsystem that's run on a Linux machine or on a, on, in a in a Linux operating system. It's a Windows subsystem in that it is a uh, a literal Subsystem subsystem of, of the Windows operating yeah. system that runs Linux, which is like the most ridiculous naming convention in the universe. But didn't they really make a Linux subsystem for Windows? Yeah, that's... when porting over SQL Server. Oh no! <laughs> I got I gotta tell you. I think I think they did just the opposite thing going to Linux. When 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 you have to explain the joke, it gets way more funny. Um, <laughs> so uh, so so clearly Microsoft in the last few years has completely turned around part of its image right so you know they they do a lot more stuff cross-platform they they understood that they were just way too late to the phone race and they gave that up i guess Mm -hmm. maybe i hope um they they embrace the linux and they you know actually could participate in the open source community i think they're one of the top contributors of code on github now yeah business-wise of course I think, and their Edge browser is really mo- a modern browser these days. Yeah, let's not get too far. So I, I would, um, I, I, I still sort of take Microsoft with a kind of maybe like a, like a small bag of salt, maybe. Um, okay. So, so Microsoft did all this stuff, but but for example, what does an average person think of Microsoft now? Uh, I'd probably say same as it ever was. Probably still more or less related to like the Bill Gates. Vista years, Bill Gates, yeah, uh, Word two thousand two or whatever. You're still kind of crashing on them, Clippy, yeah, uh, all all that stuff. Also, I think I think uh, among the normal quote unquote normal people, as in like non developer folks who um who use LinkedIn, I think people who to associate Microsoft with LinkedIn also kind of associate it with a weird kind of nagging what if we incorporated linkedin with office 365 <laughs> kind of thing yeah 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 that's true. so so i think i think that the, the that description for normal people fits pretty accurately and i think that's probably one of the bigger shames that still hasn't changed mm-hmm. um you know many years ago there was this uh designer who made a ton of really good looking like branding for microsoft Kind of just as a fun project for himself, mm-hmm. um, and then he was hired by Microsoft. Nobody ever heard from him ever again, and that, and and I think um, Microsoft has this ish, image problem, um, but not the kind of Windows like images on a disk or anything. No, like image of their brand. Like mm-hmm. nobody knows what to associate them with, other than Bill Gates. That's it. That's all there is. And um, like they have the Surface line, which airs commercials all over the place. I think they have commercials for Office 365 or something like that sometimes. Presumably they um, do. If nothing else, they have an extensive marketing association surround, uh, uh, extensive marketing organization surrounding it. That's for sure. For sure. Um, maybe they do most of their advertising um, at lunch and learns at large corporations. Like, hey, I'll give you the salad if you uh, buy my Office 365 Gold Edition. Jeez. Um, I I don't I don't know. Um, but I wish they would focus more on the consumer side and build their image for people to associate to something good and new and something that they want. Um, and they, you know, so I guess you could say that they sort of did that with Xbox, but I don't, I don't even think that's good enough to be honest. Mm-hmm. Cause no. nobody thinks like, Oh, I have an Xbox. That's Microsoft. 
they just think it's an Xbox. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd agree with you. I, I think a lot of people don't really make those connections even uh, among other companies. I think one of the few companies that has succeeded in doing that is uh, in, in, in linking the company's identity with each of their products is Apple. I think there are other, other companies that do that too. I think Amazon does a really good job of that with Alexa. And I think Google has finally turned that, that boat around uh, with Android devices in a lot of ways. Like uh, I like as a as somebody who's who's trained in um and marketing and strategy and um and communication strategy more broadly like one of the biggest surprising things to see was how google marketed the most recent slate of nexus phones as the the phone by google right right which is like yeah that's killer that's what they I, some would argue that's what they should be doing they should have been doing all along on the other hand what did that get them that's fair that's fair um <laughs> but i think yeah i i think it's i think it's i think it's turning that ship around which i guess is 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 uh better than better than nothing yeah so i i um i will mention too that um you know there's some really cool people that work at microsoft these days um and so like um you know one of the people that we actually sort of loosely knew uh, Maggie Pint, who uh, did some stuff with Moment, but who also attended JavaScript Minnesota yeah. at least once, um, she now also works at Microsoft. And I think it's super cool when you know normal people, you know, relatively speaking, um, in in sort of the JavaScript and programming community that that is accessible to us at least gets into Microsoft. Because um, I still see Microsoft as this, you know, big top tier first first you know highest order kind of company yeah absolutely and yeah. In, in addition to maggie who's an amazing amazing hire for sure um microsoft has made a bunch of uh recent hires in uh the developer relations space which is a big thing for me like one like i have massive amounts of respect for folks in the devrel community um uh jesse frizzell um who is like the person to uh to kind of like study from if you're interested in containers or any sort of container related software or the the um systems that underlie how containers work um she recently uh took a job at microsoft as a developer uh a a developer advocate i believe is the phrase they use um paige bailey another um another like gigantic force in um the uh kind of uh uh, in multiple communities, but in particularly is working uh, in Azure right now. Um, also recently took a job uh, at Microsoft in DevRel. Basically, um, basically they've really beefed up that particular team. Uh, but that that same sort of kind of uh, that same sort of uh, perspective seems to have been taking place uh, all across. The organization, which is really kind of great to see. I, I'm still with you, Ryan. I think I think that um, Microsoft is definitely a kind of uh, a company of the of the highest order for a lot of these things, and that these these teams have expanded uh, to kind of uh, hire these people who are like known awesome folks, and that these known awesome folks are even interested in taking a job at a place like Microsoft is yep. uh, uh, speaks volumes. Yep. So, is it time for our favorite section? It sure is. Sure is. New let's do Let's talk about them. <laughs> uh, so this week, I actually have a couple of really cool ones. Uh, the first one is something called Minfosec, M N F O S E C. Uh, it started by a really awesome person uh, who uh, is uh, actually interested in creating a meetup group out of this. And they uh, are focusing on talking about uh, inf- the information security community in Minnesota and encouraging uh, folks who are new to the field to check it out and learn about what uh, what the industry entails, uh, what opportunities there might be. Um, we got a preview of this uh, of, of what such a uh, such a meetup might look like at uh, the Minneapolis Junior Devs Meetup last week, and it was really awesome and really well attended. Uh, and it was just a really awesome talk. Um, both the speakers, Ian and Kat, uh, are amazing folks, um, and I I know that uh, this event, uh, when things get dialed in, uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be really cool. So uh, definitely something to keep an eye on right now. There's not a ton, uh, 
there's not a ton going on on it right now, but as things kind of spin up, uh, that'll be a great thing to watch. Next up is Zach Lieberman on Twitter. Uh, Zach has been doing some killer stuff with augmented reality recently, uh, related to, um, Zach's also related to Open Frameworks, which is a really great C++ toolkit for um, doing any sort of visualization, um, which is like super cool and something that I want to dig into a little bit more. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I want to dig into C++. Um, but I, I know, I know, but uh, his work is just awesome. So you can see why that might be the case. Uh, last but not least, at 3.1 on Twitter, uh, who is a uh, maintainer of a number of kind of uh important uh kind of uh products related to the react ecosystem among other things um so sunil pi is his um is his name here and uh he works on glamour uh is the is the maintainer of glamour uh also glam which i believe is kind of predates glamour um uh the basically lots and lots of cool stuff related to CSS and JavaScript and Markdown and JavaScript. Um, so definitely a cool person to follow. Yeah. How about you, Brian? Well, I followed, including my, my last person I followed while recording this episode, but uh-huh. um, <laughs> the first person is Tobias Coppers, who goes by at W Sakra. Um, I think uh, they are a maintainer of Webpack. I've seen some retweets from Sean Larkin, so of course I gave it a follow. Yay! Next up is Michael Jurowitz, who's at Jury on Twitter, and he's a developer at Apple. Um, apparently I have 48 followers who I follow who also follow Michael, so it's a long time coming. Um, some, I don't know, good tweets, Apple things, other stuff follow for me and last but not least is henry zoo who is at left underscore pad yes who's one of the maintainers of babel js uh behance and or i think yeah. he's, he's involved with behance and adobe as well uh i just followed him about three minutes ago he looks pretty <laughs> cool did he Pro- change his name for left pad reasons probably i mean he's, he hasn't changed it back so let me well i think you can only change your name one time right uh, I think you can do it. Well, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know. I've only changed mine once, so. Yeah. Yeah. So, he's uh, good to follow. Uh, I most notably see a tweet about deprecating Babel preset ES 2015. Because uh, that is being deprecated. And I support that, so I just retweeted it. Fun fact. Nice. Ryan, what about you? Yeah, I uh, I followed some people. Now, this, this is going way back to uh, open, uh, no, wait, not open source, uh, Midwest JS. Um, so these are some of the, the, these first two are speakers from that. So we have here uh, Mark Volkman, and he um, was actually the uh, keynote speaker on the opening day. And um, he works at, um, what does he work at? Object Computing, which is a kind of a, teaching slash consulting company they kind of they, they're kind of an interesting consulting company i'd say um but he he works there but he also does a lot of kind of like uh you know outreach kind of stuff integration with the community um which is really cool and he's been working in the industry for a super long time so that was cool uh nice. next up here is dan callahan and he actually works as a developer advocate at mozilla and uh, he was showing us, um, you know, which web is it? It's WebAssembly. Yes, WebAssembly. <laughs> um, and, of course, his headlining tweet today is, Today's W3 decision is a victory for DRM vendors on the web. Who are they? Google, Adobe, and Apple. Um, each, of course, have their own flavor of DRM. And then I, of course, followed uh, Tom Dale, um, who has a really cool website, um, and uh, there was a there was some TypeScript stuff that I was reading from him recently, and there was some other posts, um, kind of like uh, compilers are the new frameworks, and um, you know that kind of thing. So it's, it's he 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 posts some really cool stuff, and uh, seems pretty interesting. Nice, absolutely good folks. The lot, good yep, folks yeah, totally. The lot. So, uh, what's up for the next month? <laughs> 
That is uh, a very I'll be good writing question. some Angular JS. That's good. <laughs> As always, here. I'm gonna try to dive back into ARKit. That is something that I mm, kind of yeah. had to had to take, uh, you know, kind of ease up on the uh, on the gas pedal there for a little while, uh, while some other stuff came up. But I'm gonna try to dive back into that. Uh, and uh, I don't know, uh, doing some fun little uh, UDP hacking uh, that hopefully I'll have something a little bit more cohes- cohesive to uh, share with next time around. How about you, Ryan? Yeah, I think I'm going to be uh, doing some view stuff, but um, I've also been trying to get into Gatsby. Uh, Gatsby's cool, but like all products that uh, were released as a 1.0 fairly recently, it still has some uh, documentation holes, let's just say. Ooh, yes. But but even worse, the plugins have documentation holes, which means nothing works the right. way you'd expect them to. The uh, documentation um, holes in Gatsby JS have documentation holes, which is kind of paradoxical. Uh, and, and, and so it turns out subtracting from a negative number in documentation doesn't actually make it positive. So, yeah. No, it, it actually makes it exponentially more negative, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty much true. Well, where can we find you on the internet, Ryan? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter or Ryan Mar, and of course on my website, RyanRepresent.com, which might be one day in Gatsby, powered by React. That what? thing that I might maybe like slightly a little bit more than view sometimes, occasionally, rarely. What? That's awesome. Nice. I look forward to it. Yep. How about uh, you, Brian? Y- you can find me on the internet at Brian Mitch L on Twitter or my website, brianm.me, which should have links to any other place you could ever want to contact me. What about you, Brandon? Uh, you can find me on the internet at various places, fewer than previously, uh, but mostly at twitter.com slash Brandon underscore MN. That's B-R-A-N-D-O-N underscore M as in Minnesota and as in the N in Minnesota. Not that that's uh, <laughs> not that that's uh, super easy to find, but uh, nonetheless, that's where I post about most things, um, mostly related to uh, weird stuff like ARKit and UDP hacking I've been doing, and occasionally uh, weird puns that come to me as I'm uh, leaving the building, which uh, such as today where I wrote uh, and I quote, assuming I can find my Twitter, Brandon underscore N M. Uh, who called it going to play foosball and not a foos errand? Uh, yes, if you want more witticisms like that, which I can't imagine why you wouldn't, you can follow me there. Uh, I think that just about does it for me. All right, well, this has been a good episode. You can find the show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk32. And... Until next month, have a good one. Have a good one. Yes, we'll see you then. Take care. Bye. Adios.